मैडम जी टिकट हो गया टिकट मैडम टिकट warmly welcome all of you to the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Debt All. Our session now is supported by the JCB Prize for Literature. Journeys from the Margins, Deepa Anapara and Annie Zaidi in conversation with Shehnaz Habib. A session featuring two disquieting novels that unblinkly examine inequity and alienation across Indian society. Prelude to a Riot by Annie Zaidi is the disturbing narrative of two families and graphs the growth of religious intolerance. Deepa Anapara's debut novel, Jin Patrol on the Purple Line, a haunting tale of heartbreak and the loss of innocence, has found resonance with readers around the world. They speak with writer and translator Shehnaz Habib about their writing process and the source of their inspirations. Deepa Anapara's first novel, Jin Patrol on the Purple Line, won the Tata Literature Live First Book Award for Fiction and was shortlisted for the JCB Prize for Literature and longlisted for the Women's Prize. Anizaidi is the author of Bread Cement Cactus, a memoir of belonging and dislocation, prelude to a riot, Gulab, Love Stories, 1 to 14, and the editor of Unbound, 2000 Years of Indian Women's Writing. Shehnaz Habib is the translator of the novel Jasmine Days, for which she and the author Ben Yamin won the JCB Prize. She is currently writing Airplane Mode, a book of subversive travel writing forthcoming from Catapult. Please do remember to comment by typing it in the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, Journeys from the Margins, Deepa Anapara and Annie Zaidi in conversation with Shehnaz Habib. Thank you so much to the team at JLF. Deepa and Annie, I'm super excited to be here and to talk about your books. They've both been on my mind since I read them. And it's especially interesting to have you both in conversation because there are all these resonances between your books. So I was thinking maybe we could start with each of you telling us who is sort of your favorite character from your book? Um, and, you know, this could be the main character, this could be maybe a character who sort of sat on your shoulder and insisted you write the story, um, or it could be a character who's sort of on the sidelines, but you want to explore them more. So, Annie, shall we start with you? Yeah. Um, so, my novel, Prelude to a Red, is constructed as a series of soliloquies, and... Um, each chapter is a character's point of view. Um, some characters recur, but by and large, it, each chapter is a different point of view. So there are a lot of characters. Um, there are no main characters as such. Uh, it's just multiple perspectives of what's going to happen. It's really difficult for me to pick one because I find, obviously, I find all of them interesting. Um, there are characters you identify with and the characters you don't identify with. So for instance, some characters are bigoted and those are more difficult to write because I don't identify with them. Uh, but because I'm choosing this form, the form of the internal monologue, uh, I still have to access them in some way, try and get inside of them in some way. Mm -hmm. um, from that perspective, I find Saju's character very interesting. So uh, the context for those who haven't yet read the book is that um, this is set in a certain town. I don't name the town, but it's a story of a small town uh, where nothing terrible has happened yet. But the atmosphere of the town is slowly being corroded and uh, the amity that prevailed earlier uh, for generations is slowly being eroded and is being replaced by a new aggression and, and an otherization of Muslims in particular, but of migrants in general too. Um, so there are two families, uh, sort of inter, inter, 
they're not really friends as families. These are not two families that are friends, but two people in these families are friends with each other. Um, there's Devaki, who is uh, who was in college with Saju and Abu. So Abu is from one family. Devaki is from another family. Saju is a third friend. These three were great friends in college. They used to do everything together. Um, at some point, Devaki ended up marrying Saju. Uh, she didn't marry Abu. She's very good friends with him. But she's married Saju now. Now Saju's character I find interesting from creative viewpoint because he didn't start out bigoted. Uh, he he started out actually being the very opposite of it. He was quite um, he was more radical in his views than either uh, Devaki or Abu. More articulate, more uh, able to come up with arguments that that uh, reveal the hollowness of the uh, of of a certain kind of you know uh, a hateful viewpoint. But now that he's married to Devaki, and Devaki's family is very bigoted. Uh, her father, particularly, is quite, uh, quite a uh, not a very nice man, um, and they're well to do. Now the thing is, he, they didn't want. It's an intercaste marriage. They didn't want the marriage. Uh, he had to fight to marry her. Having married her, he now craves the approval of that family, of the men in that family, particularly the the father and the elder brother. In his interactions, in his desire to be approved by people who are both powerful locally, they are locally powerful people, they are wealthy people, but also somebody who is obviously a, a kind of other for him, you know, uh, being from a different caste, uh, being people who really disliked you at some point and are now very slowly sending out feelers to try and, you know, to try and... Uh, this person whom they've rejected to try and accept this person into the fold. In doing so, he has to bend a little. And that bending is bringing out all sorts of horrible things in him. You mm. know, the little jealousy, the, 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 the little resentment he feels, uh, not because Abu is doing anything wrong. It's Abu is still the same. You know, he's, he's, he's trying to grow intellectually. He's trying to become... Uh, somebody in, in a different city. Saju's character resents this person, partly, I suspect, I don't write this in the book, but I suspect, for reminding him of what he used to be and reminding him of a certain um, viewpoint that he is starting to abandon. And he senses that his own wife resents him for it. And therefore, that kind of the anger builds inside him. Mm -hmm. Because he thinks he's doing the right thing by by accepting his wife's family when his wife herself does not really want that acceptance. Mm -hmm. So I think from a creative viewpoint, I find that person very interesting. In a way, he's become a fence sitter. You know, mm -hmm. he's he's not um, he's not the sort of person who will go out there and whip up hatred in society, but he'll go along. With and I think that uh, in some ways, those are quite dangerous people in society who are willing to go along with hate, willing to let things pass because there is opportunity or because they don't foresee themselves being affected by the consequences of this hate. Mm -hmm. So um, what, I'm hoping that answers your question somewhat. Absolutely, yes, yeah. Um, and I love the way you wrote Saju's character, he, he's not outright evil. He, he, you know, I feel like that character was an opportunity to trace all the small pettinesses, resentment, feeling jealous, indifferent, um, feeling a sort of nostalgia for his past self, but knowing that his future social mobility is sort of wrapped up with this other life. So yeah, that character was such a, um, had such a complex, in, you know, interior life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Deepa, do you want to take a shot of the question? Sure. So uh, my novel is about three children who are looking for their missing friends in an unnamed North Indian city. And it's told from their point of view. And uh, the primary narrator is a nine-year-old boy named Jay. And in writing this story, I wanted to understand how children experienced the disappearances of their friends, uh, what they felt about what was happening in their neighborhood. 
So it's told from a child's point of view, that's Jay, who is just nine. And he is the primary narrator, but there are also chapters which are told from the point of view of uh, the children who go missing. And um, for me, I think the experiences of the girls who go missing, the chapters written uh, from their point of view, those are closer to you know, my own experiences as a girl and then as a woman in India. But um, writing Jay for me I, uh, was uh, different, also somewhat difficult because you know he's not like me at all. He has a kind of optimism about the world, which I don't quite share. But apart from that, uh, it's you know he had all these he has all these freedoms that he can experience as a boy. Uh, so in a way, it was a sort of wish fulfillment, I think, in writing his character because he can you know go out into the street even in the time of these disappearances, because, you know, he has this kind of in belief in himself that he's invincible. And some of that belief comes from having grown up as a boy in the society that kind of idolizes boys and having those privileges that he takes for granted, even within his own household. So it was, I think I enjoyed writing uh, from his point of view, because, you know, those, those are not my experiences at all in many ways. And it was interesting to uh, see how, you know, as a boy, you experience, uh, you know, the world that as a girl, I would, I would have been quite frightened of, uh, say, a crowded street, but that's not how he sees it. So that is, for me, an interesting dynamic to kind of observe in the novel. And you also make, let the girl character sort of so as a foil for that freedom, the way, um, the freedoms that, you know, Jay has at access to are not available for Pari or for Runu Didi. So there is, you know, you sort of explore both the freedom and the restriction through these different characters. Yeah. Both of you chose to set your stories in um, unnamed places. And you just mentioned that it was set in an unnamed mountain town and your novel Deepa is set um, in an unnamed city. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about the freedom perhaps that an unnamed city or an unnamed place um, offers as a setting for both of you. Um, Deepa, do you want to take on that? Sure. So yeah, absolutely. As you mentioned, there is a certain freedom in uh, setting a place, choosing a fictional city because you know you can populate it the way you want to and you can create a railway station or a highway where it best fits the interest of the story. So definitely that was a factor. But for me, I think the main factor was that I wanted some distance from the real life stories of disappearances that kind of mm -hmm. unfolded in India almost, you know, daily. Uh, and particularly uh, in cities like uh, Delhi and Bombay, you see so many of these stories. Uh, and, you know, people are still waiting for their children to come back or they don't know where their children are. And I was very mindful that I should not, uh, you know, trespass on that very real grief that people still feel. And for me to create a fictional city was a way to give myself permission to write the story because I really took a long time from, you know, first thinking of this idea to actually writing it because I kept worrying that I did not have the right to write about this subject. And one of the ways in which I could grant myself permission was to create a fictional town. And that gave me the distance from, you know, the real life stories of disappearances. Mm -hmm. And you, is that your experience too, that having an unnamed place was a sort of permission? Hmm. No, I don't think it was so much of a permission thing. In general, I've noticed this, somebody called it, uh, uh, brought it to my attention actually, that I tend not to name things. Uh, I'm terrible at titles. Um, I wrote a book of uh, love stories. It's a collection of short stories. None of the characters or places are named. Um, I didn't even bother properly with titles. I mean, um, I think with me, a thing is that I'm really interested in the inside of people's minds. Mm -hmm. And the way I write tends to just cut straight to that. So awesome. I think the outside, I know, I know exactly where this place is in my head, right? And a lot of the conversations, a lot of the places visually when I'm seeing it are physical places. And, and um, I, I wasn't really thinking of permission. 
Um, however, because it is a very political book, um, and because this is a place that is still peaceful, you know, it it actually hasn't had any riots. I was. It is true that I was even in interviews, etc. I don't really name the place because I don't want to kind of stigmatize a place in in that sense, a place mm -hmm. that has not yet witnessed violence. Um, the perception of violence through words, through attitudes, is mine. So mm -hmm. I was a little wary of that with this book in particular. Uh, mm -hmm. In in other books, I tend not to name, but for different reasons. I mean, I think it's just that the place, the naming of it, doesn't do anything for me in a creative way. It it mm -hmm. uh, perhaps there is a kind of freedom. I'm not sure. I have I'll have to think a little bit more about this. But for this, I I was really anxious that it shouldn't become the novel shouldn't become about oh she's written about that place and then people who live in that place come back at you. And we're like, no, our place is not like this. And I'm like, well, you know, to me, it is like this. So um, I think just to avoid that kind of conflict. Uh, yeah. I, one of the most brilliant aspects of your novel for me is exactly this, that it sort of is the prelude. It sort of describes the moment before the riot. And it's interesting that, you know, what you said about how a place can, you know, get stigmatized by the fact that, um, this horrible event happened here. Um, and, you know, then it gets so much attention, especially from the media, and it gets a sort of reputation um, and becomes part of a history in a particular way. Whereas you chose to, you know, turn your attention and witness the this very liminal time when you can kind of smell the way things are changing, the violence is perhaps not even in the air, but you can kind of like, there's a wind bringing it this way. Um, and it kind of subverts the idea that, you know, a plot is where all the action happens because you're choosing to look at this moment before the action happens. And that, how did you narratively choose that particular moment? Why was that interesting to you um, in comparison to say, you know, the moments that we're often told that we should write about or are more interesting because there's a climax um, in terms of a narrative arc? Um, so violence has never really interested me. Um, um, I, uh, I am interested in the what comes before and what comes after. I'm mm -hmm. interested in the aftermath of violence, but I am not interested in the moment of violence. It's, I often think it's actually quite boring. Uh, mm -hmm. The act of one person killing another is so ancient. It's been done and done and done. And... Uh, uh, and when you do have moments like this where um, large crowds converge on defenseless people and kill them, um, what could I possibly, I mean, I think about it, but I, I do not find that an interesting subject to write on. It's terrifying, but it's not interesting in that way to me. I, I wouldn't change anything about it. I could accurately represent it if I see it. But for me, that is more the space for nonfiction than fiction. Fiction needs to do something else. It, it needs to shift something, either in people's hearts or it needs to, you know, um, uh, uh, do something which um, allows you to enter the space as a writer and, and then see what's really going on here. What can I capture of this moment? So for me, that was interesting. Also, um, I didn't really set out to write this novel. Mm -hmm. I was researching a nonfiction story. I wanted to write about plantations and farm wages actually, and labor rights. And I was traveling and I went to this place to see, um, because this was a place where uh, labor wages were slightly higher. And um, and there was a lot of conflict around that because people were trying to uh, get rid of the old laborers who, who would demand a minimum wage and then start to hire migrant workers for a lesser wage. So I went there for that reason. When I went there, I found this thing in the air, this wind that the, the word you described, like a wind coming, I sensed it. Mm. And I found myself being frightened of the place a little bit. Um, not 
not in terms of immediate danger not not like i expected people to start attacking me or attacking each other immediately but definitely the shift was there and i went away from this place i knew i knew i needed to come back a few more times to research my article but i also found myself not wanting to go back um, i i had lost interest in the details of non fiction you know the the journalistic inquiry kind of took a back seat and the human the 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 inquiry into people's hearts and minds that became urgent so i spent some time just typing up my notes thinking about this how do i think about this and i just started writing down the things people had said to me mm-hmm. and that then became solid okay you know in some things i saw some things i heard some things weren't quite said but you know i know those characters i'm looking at them and i'm trying to get inside their heads to think what what are what are people feeling how how must they react what happens when a man like abu lives in a town like this what would he do what happens to his little sister who's just a little girl so i became more interested in it for that reason you know that that i am interested in how people react to the provocation of violence you can see some people do flee and um i began to see things in a different way like newspapers right there are the, there were these um uh, not in that particular town in another context i saw ads for distress sales you know when people just want to up and leave very quickly to escape because they know that this violence will come in two months or five months or one year it's coming so i started to notice those things you know uh, the undercutting of wages the way in which all these things are linked the way in which hatred ties up with um, and and this is something that could happen in any town this town, it, it is not a story of this town it is a story of every town mm. so i think that was my decision finally that i i wanted to go for the thing which is just graspable but not graspable to mm. tell the story um that that you don't really know how to tell because it's not here yet so i as a writer that was an exciting project for me mm. um, and a place to park my own fears i think yes absolutely yes i could i definitely felt a sense of recognition to this idea of the prelude because um you know it's always those who have something to lose who have to pay attention to that preliminary moment that prelude moment you know notice the distress sales notice the way the newspapers have started reporting things in a certain way um and i want to go back to what you know any you just talked about how fiction allowed you to write these stories that um maybe a character would not overtly say in so many words to a journalist and deepa you've also worked as a journalist for years and i believe um you you had all, all the i i i read that you wanted to tell the media attention on the stories of the disappearing children um was very particular very specific in the sensationalist way that left out the actual stories of the children so both of you are coming to this novel this debut novel of yours with a journalistic background that has sort of fed into the writing of these novels um and any you just talked about that specific way in which fiction lets you witness um something that you observed as a journalist deepa could you tell us a little bit about that too about how fiction lets you do that yeah um you know when i was living in delhi for instance and the stories of disappearances were coming out the focus was always on the perpetrators i mean that's the only time these stories get reported if a child goes missing that doesn't appear on tv or you know on the tv news or in papers it's only when somebody is caught and then there's some you know horrific details of the crime itself which are quite sensationalist in many ways that the news gets uh, sort of publicized and people are interested in the sort of um, gory details uh, which i think you know it's a sort of um, details of the violence is what fascinates people and i'm not interested in that at all i'm interested in how uh, we as human beings how do we deal with that violence how do we change our lives or you know change ourselves or can we change at all to accept sort of uh, a horrific tragedy the disappearance of a child is 
in many cases a horrific tragedy for most parents. Uh, there are also stories in which parents have sent children away. That's why I'm making that distinction. But if if it is the story of you know a disappearance of a child, it's there is this enormous tragedy and how are the parents, how is the family dealing with that tragedy? That was something that uh, I didn't see at that time. And uh, for me, I'm not I'm not interested in. I think there are people who are interested in the perpetrators of the crime in their psyches and you know what motivates them to commit those crimes, but th that's not where my interest lay at all. Um, I think as a journalist, you know, this is a story that I tried to, I wanted to do, but really couldn't because it's very difficult to interview children to do and get them to talk to you about their emotions or their experiences or what they're feeling. And it was easier for me to access that through fiction because it's a way in which I could sort of, you know, return the agency to them that they actually don't have in real life. They can't really uh, speak up when something goes wrong. Uh, they don't really have a voice. And so for me, this novel was a way to um, create a narrative in which children could speak up for themselves. It would be really hard to do that, I think, as a uh, Nonfiction. I can't really think of uh, any book which is, you know, nonfiction that looks at children in that way because children don't sit down and they don't. They don't really. They're not really honest uh, about what they're feeling, and you know, they want to get away and do something else. Uh, that was my experience, and as a journalist, I used to talk to them. So this was, I think, for me, uh, you know, fiction was a way to access that story, which is actually quite quite a difficult story because these experiences are, are quite tragic and uh, difficult to process. So this was a way of understanding how they could do that, you know, how they could process trauma. I don't, I don't know if that answers the question about <laughs> being a journalist. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually had to stop being a journalist to write the novel because, you know, for years I really struggled to make that switch from fact to fiction because I'd, I placed such a high level of importance on research and on things being true that for me to trust my imagination, it took a really long time. So it is mm -hmm. difficult for me to stop being a journalist and uh, concentrate on fiction and, you know, give myself permission to create these characters and, yeah, mm -hmm. write them. Well, fiction also lets you sort of play around with point of views um, and you don't have to have this journalistic objectivity mode. Um, was that also a factor perhaps for either of you in choosing to write this as a novel? I and mean, you play with many different um, point of views in your novel. Um, what, what made you sort of choose this multi, you know, this polyphonic um, uh, voice for your novel? Yeah, I actually, uh... Like I mentioned, I started out just writing down the things people had said to me. I yeah. had met multiple people, uh, at least three or four people. And I thought initially that maybe maybe this will end up being just a set of monologues or maybe mm -hmm. just one, one or two monologues. Uh, I thought, I didn't know. I, I often struggle with form because I do work in multiple formats. I do write plays, I do write short stories. So I didn't know what it was going to be. I mean, started off as nonfiction and then it became something else entirely. So when I wrote the first two kind of internal monologues, I thought, is this going to be a play? Um, but I was not satisfied. So then I wrote two more and I thought maybe if it's three or four, it can be a short story, you know, just mm -hmm. playing with form within, within the form of a short story. And I sent it to a friend and he said that there's more, that there's something more coming. So mm -hmm. keep at, keep writing. And uh, and he was right, because um, initially I was just writing, you know, the people who said a lot of this stuff were the more bigoted voices, you know, with the things that I found most distressing. Those were the things I started to write first. And um, then there were Devaki's character, particularly. She's a feminine voice there. Um, I found women um, in this community uh, very absent. And, and this is not a community that's known for being repressive towards women. So they weren't repressed in the sense that it's not like they were being killed at birth or, you know, it wasn't that they, were, they weren't educated. They were educated. 
they were playing sport they were doing you know the things that that from a non fictional um, a kind of census takers perspective that you would tick all the boxes and say the women are empowered but i also found that the women were remarkably absent in a conversational sense they were sort of there hovering in the background often in the kitchen always cooking um not participating in these conversations and i became very interested in are they on board with these ideas you know they're not participating dating in in this kind of hateful conversation they just sort of there um and i i i then once i started writing devaki's uh, monologue the idea of her sister in law who is more confident than her in some ways being an older woman having children you know uh, more confident as a wife but at the same time doesn't really have a say in the she has a say at home doesn't have a say outside the home doesn't get to run things around in the city the city is still controlled by men um i became interested in that so with each monologue i found something else emerge the character of mariam in the bakery um comes from for example i saw these children especially a really young girl uh, not not a very little girl but a teenage kind of girl kind of kneading dough um and in in a very hot kitchen that environment you know it was it that triggered something in that town what does that kind of girl in that kind of place in that kind of town feel what is this girl who's grown now into a middle aged woman um feel in in this kind of environment so the more i wrote the more interested i became in people's stories which go beyond the violence ultimately their lives may be impacted by the violence but what is this town what is the nature of um this beast you know uh, mm-hmm. which will both create and suffer violence both things will happen to this place um who are the people in this place how what side will they take will they take a side those were the questions that were triggering it and and i think ultimately it's not the story of people it's even though it is told entirely in voices it is the story of the place it is yes. the story of this town so um that form became then very important because how do you how do you tell the story of a place you tell it through people you tell it through scraps that you find uh, newspaper advertisements you tell it through articles editorials the letters people write to each other the poetry that is being written in that place um, mm-hmm. how people are responding to the poetry that is being written in that place so mm-hmm. i think i chose the form based on that Mhm yes and you also have uh, a commentary by uh, Garuda sir's history lessons so you know although it's about this place there is sort of like this universalization the sense of uh, this place being part of a cycle um and speaking of form deepa i was so interested how you used um you know the crime show and the detective novel as sort of the uh, formats that jay is you know immediately attracted to and i feel like we have to talk about how you know how much the detective novel and the crime show does not prepare us or children for the way justice really operates in the world um and i love how the you know the the whole detective novel solving the crime trope just crumbles um somewhere after the middle of the book um can you talk a little bit about those choices yeah i think one one was that um, often when i used to interview children one way to break the ice was to talk about television shows because it's something that they all watched you know i was writing really for them boring stories on education it was not something that they wanted to talk to me about and uh, it was easier to engage them if i talked about what kind of tv they watched and reality tv is hugely popular and this particular show that jay watches is based on a real show which ran in india for sort of 18 years so it's it's a testament to its popularity but i think what those shows allow you is to sort of distance yourself from what's happening so it just becomes some kind of entertainment and i've often seen that um when there's sort of big crimes that happen in various indian cities and there's no clear answer as to who is 
committed the crime, um, you know, when I was working in offices, there'd be discussions in the office as to who could it be, was it, you know, the, the parent or the servant or those sorts of discussions. And I was always used to be shocked by those conversations because I used to, I used to think this is, uh, you know, we're talking about the death of a real person or a real child, but it's somehow it's become kind of entertaining. So I really wanted to challenge those sort of tropes while also relying on them in many ways. So I think the basic scaffolding mm -hmm. of the novel comes from that of a detective novel. There is a crime and there's somebody trying to solve that crime. But, you know, real life doesn't happen like it does in a crime show or, you know, there's sort of, uh, there's no manual really on how to handle something like this, especially for a child. So I was really, uh, I think that's that's what I try to do because uh, I've watched some of those shows for reference, the, re the true shows, the, you know, the real counterparts and found it quite, uh, I mean, stomach churning in many ways in what they were portraying. But at the same time, you know, the fact that they were so, they are so popular, it's, it, it's clearly feeding into something. And I think with Jay, so it's a sort of, that interest in crime shows for him initially begins as some form of entertainment, then it becomes a way to convince himself that, you know, he is a detective and so he himself can't be harmed because he's the one trying to solve the crime. Yes. And, but then all those sort of narrative that he's creating is challenged by the, yeah, as the novel progresses. Yes, it's, and you know, it's interesting that Jay never thinks of himself as somebody without agency. He thinks of himself as having the agency to, you know, solve this um, or this series of crimes and to lead the detective, um, you know, the group of detectives that he has cobbled together. It reminds me a little, Annie, of what we, you talked about in your email about the margins and who gets to define the margins. Um, and especially in relation to the title of our conversation. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what do you mean by that, about how, who gets to define the margins and its relationship with fiction? Yeah, I, I, I do think it is really interesting, um, the idea of marginality. You know, everybody's at the center of their own lives, right? And so particularly in fiction, when you're, when you're entering uh, a fictional space, um, entering characters' lives, um, obviously they are at the center of you know, regardless of who they are, whoever the protagonist is, whether it's uh, like in Deepa's case, it's a, uh, a little kid who's sort of on the streets and has very little power actually, or any other character, you know, I mean, you, you, you take um, a character like Oliver Twist, for example, you know, uh, from, from Dickens, um, in a, from a socio-political perspective, you might say that this character is marginal. From a fictional perspective, certainly not. It's, it's at the heart of the project. Right? And even from a socio-political perspective, I think one of the problems with very easily ascribing marginality to a group or an individual, um, one of the problems with that is that uh, you automatically decide that whatever this person is not is the mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe in society, actually, there's this, I'm not so sure there is a clearly defined mainstream. You know, you just think about the word, you know, it, it, in my, to me, it conjures up like this great river, you know, just rushing out and cutting a path and, and that, uh, forcing people to kind of flow along with it, etc., from an ideological perspective too. Um, so from a fictional viewpoint, I do think that there isn't really a, a from a creative viewpoint, perhaps I shouldn't say from a fictional viewpoint, from a creative viewpoint, um, the idea of marginality, I feel is a little bit problematic. Like who is a marginal character? Is can your fiction be described as as the fiction of the margins? Um, from whose perspective? Marginal from whose perspective? Uh, really, um, are these people really whose voices are never heard? Like in my novel, I wouldn't say these are people whose voices are never heard. Um, 
you know, in, in any way, right, left or center. <clears throat> these are people whose voices um, I am trying to conjure fresh, but these are not necessarily unheard in any way. So I, I find that a little difficult, that question of marginality. Um, I think perhaps disempowerment is a better word, even, even from a socio-political perspective, because this is really about power, isn't it? It's not really about um, a kind of solid block at the center and people all around it at the margins. This is finally about the exercise of power. So I find um, perhaps disempowered groups a little bit better. Although in fiction, I don't know if I would even use that because from creative viewpoint, again, power becomes much more complex in, in uh, its definition and in the ways that it is exercised. Mm. Well, I wish we could go on, but I think that is also a really thought-provoking note to end on. We are out of time. Um, thank you both so much for joining us. And it's been really wonderful to listen to what you have to say and to see how in many ways, both your novels talk about these preludes, preliminary moments before the violence, before the, uh, what we've been taught is the main action. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you, Shana. Thanks for the questions, Shana. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you, Annie Zaidi, Deepa Anapara, and Shainaz Habib for that thought-provoking discussion and sharing pertinent insights into issues seldom addressed in Indian society. We thank the JCB Prize for Literature for supporting the session. We thank our celebration partner, Diageo. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Do stay logged on and continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions specially curated for you. समाज अपनी भाषा में ही आता है कंटेंट आपकी भाषा में ओनली ऑन डेली हंट हमें पता है आपको क्या चाहिए अपनी पसंद का कंटेंट ओनली ऑन डेली हंट रखो अपने एरिया की खबर लोकल अपडेट्स ओनली ऑन डेली हंट